Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty, the number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This episode 108. Today's guest is an actress and model. She's a former Miss Nebraska. You know her from Love Potion Number no. 9, Port Charles, Love Hard, her many Hallmark movies, including Cut, Color, Murder, her guest appearances on such hits as Cheers, Ellen, Home Improvement, and of course, she played Jerry's girlfriend, Kristen, in the season six episode of Seinfeld, The Pledge Drive. Please welcome Rebecca Staub. Rebecca, thanks for joining. Hi, yeah. Thanks. Nice to be here. <laughs> So, Rebecca, take us back. Um, October of 94, believe it or not, the Pledge Drive aired on NBC uh, Thursday night. What do, you, what do you remember about the audition process? How how'd the role for Kristen come about? That's so funny. That's why I was going to ask you what year it was. Nine, that was 94. You know, I remember a lot of, I don't, I, I was like raking my brain trying to remember the audition. And I don't remember that much from the actual audition. Uh, I was obviously familiar with the show. Actually, when I'm I'm from Omaha, and one of my best friends uh, that I've known since high school used to open for Jerry. uh, When Jerry- Pat Hayes. Yeah, Pat Hayes. Yeah, you you know Pat? Yeah, wow, yeah, we talked to him. He's a fellow Nebraska. Okay, he's a fellow Nebraska guy. We didn't put that together. Yeah. Well, it's funny, yeah, Rebecca. I asked him who his favorite, you know, Nebraskan is Johnny Carson or uh, Tom Osborne or uh, Warren Buffett. We'll, we'll we'll finish with that question. But yeah, Pat Hazel. <laughs> yeah, that's big friend funny. of the show. That's so funny that you guys know him. Yeah. So uh, hold on, I'm just shrinking this. Um, when I was in New York, uh, then you know, Pat was always opening for Jerry, and so you know, we would hang out, like, you know, we'd go for pizza, we went to a Mets game, like, I still have my, my tank top that I bought at the Mets game, so, like, I knew Jerry, you know, you know, he was already a big comic, but it was way before the show, and Pat, you know, wrote, like, the, kind of the pilot season, and at the time, you know, I lived really close to the studio where they were writing, and so Pat would always come over to our apartment, you know, afterwards and before, and, you know, kind of brainstorm about like the show and characters. I remember one thing specifically is when they were coming up with Elaine's name because we were sitting there and it's like, it has to be a name of, you know, like a friend, but you know, not a girlfriend, but somebody that you'd stay friends with. And like the whole kind of psychology of going into the names, you know, for the characters. Wow. So I remember specifically the night that we sat there and we're kind of brainstorming and I don't know, if one of us came up with Elaine or that was, you know, like in the studio and stuff. But so since I'd known Jerry, you know, in New York years past, just from stand up and hung out with them on a personal level and then was around when they were kind of putting the show together. By the time I finally got to audition, uh, you know, I mean, it was thrilling because that was what season was that? You guys probably have that. Six. Was that like, it was season oh, six. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it had been on. A while. And that was the first time I'd auditioned. I'd never auditioned before, like nothing had ever come up. And so, you know, it was, it was cool to finally be able to audition. And then it felt good that the time that I auditioned, I got it. So, and the other small note about it, it was so funny because like the day before that audition, I found out that my boyfriend at the time was like screwing around on me. And so booking that audition was like the best, you know, like, bump of like confidence and and you know all that kind of stuff because it's like fine who cares i'm doing seinfeld you know that it was it was like okay oh that was good because it really it was a good cushion around you know this other kind of chaos in my life so leading up to it like that's what i remember even though i don't remember much from the actual in the room audition Wow, that's a great story. I mean, the Pat Hazel connection is awesome. We didn't like, we didn't put that together. That's so cool. Yeah, he was on with us. Um, that's a great great revenge too. I mean, how many million people saw that episode? You know, when it aired, yeah. uh, you know, in, in, you know, uh, and it's like I get a Jerry's six. girl. You know, <laughs> oh, go um, go. That's I got great. So you get to the set and um, you're there for the whole week of taping and 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 you know, kind of there for for all of it. I'm assuming because there's a yeah. lot of guest stars and things on that episode. It was a wild week for so many reasons. One, Andy Ackerman, the director, was sick all week. So we didn't really have a director per se. So it was really Larry David and Jerry 
you know, kind of directed. But, you know, by that time, the show kind of put itself together. And right. so you know, behind the scenes, as far as camera shots and whatever, you know, they were handling that. But it was kind of interesting on set because we really kind of got Larry, Larry, David and Jerry that that Andy didn't come back until like Friday night when we actually taped it. So that was one thing that was interesting. Another thing that was interesting was that it was the week before the Emmy Awards. And the Emmy Awards that year, their their theme was women in comedy. And somehow there was a gigantic oversight and Julie Louis-Dreyfus was not part of the Emmys. For oh, women. Wow. Yeah. So there was a lot of behind the scenes ruffling around, you know, trying right. to make that happen because it was, I don't, you know, whatever network did it, it was a gigantic oversight. So that was kind of looming. And then at the same time, the guys all had comedy sketches in that Emmy thing itself. And so in addition to shooting our show, like in between, they kind of be off on the side working on their little sketches for the Emmy presentation. And so like that was going on. And, uh, and, you know, and it was just like all of these little things. It was so funny because, you know, like Jerry and I had the identical watch. Like at the time I wore like a men's watch, like this brightling black face. Like it was a kind of a, not rare, like super expensive, but you know, it was a very unique watch. And I remember walking on set and I'm like, you have my watch. Like we had the same. And so like, there was like that little kind of connection, but he remembered me too from all of those years before in New York so then, you know, that was, so it was, you know, easy and comfortable that, you know, even though you're still kind of like, you know, I felt like, you know, I kind of knew him. And, uh, I mean, other two very other specific things. It was, you know, who they, everybody was so nice. Like during all the rehearsals, the scenes that I wasn't in, I would just kind of sit up in the, in the bleachers and watch. And Jason Alexander would always come and sit next to me like he could be anywhere he'd be off in the wings or off in his dressing room or you know sitting down the ways but he would always just come sit next to me and so he and I would just sit and yik yak you know during during the scenes that we weren't in and that was just so like it just it just so felt like home you know it kind of felt like oh like I went to school with all these guys you know that kind of feeling and I tell you the sweetest thing was every single solitary day when we would break for lunch, Uncle Leo would come to my dressing room and knock on the door <laughs> and ask if he could escort me to the commissary. And so he would wow. take the arm and we would, you know, cross the lot. And, you know, I, I mean, we probably ended up eating together because I wasn't going to, you know. And so, but it was so nice, like every day, like whatever it was, you know, as soon as we broke for lunch, he'd be like, knock, knock, knock. And, you know, he'd be there and he's like, may I escort you to lunch, mademoiselle? And take my arm and, you know, we would like promenade off. And, and like, Len, Len, Len Lesser. Yep. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So it was really, you know, because like none of those guys needed to do that kind right. of stuff. You go, well, there's a new guest star every week. You know, there's another pretty girl every week. But there was just something where you just felt really special you know it's not just like oh what what's the story today and that's the other yeah when you said how many guest stars yeah you know, a lot that, of this one that episode i think it had seven storylines like that each had a beginning middle and end and you think of the genius of that script that within 22 minutes they had seven stories with beginning middle and end it was yep. there was so much going on so uh yeah it was I mean, it's extremely memorable. Yeah, that episode, you know, growing up in New York, always had a special place in our being Yankee fans and the whole thing with, with Danny Tartable and obviously, you know, obviously watching The Pledge Drive and Ken Burns. It was just like, yeah. there was so much going on in that episode. It's like, just, there was silliness, but to feel good about uh, Jerry's Nana, like, there was so much going on. Like you said, so many guest stars, like from Uncle Leo... <laughs> And it was to Danny Tartable. It was the yeah, it was Danny Tartable, yeah, Nana, uh, the the high talker, and then it was like kind of that ongoing joke with with cutting the Snickers bar. Mr. Yeah, Pitt. yeah, Mr. Morgan. And Mr. then it was Pitt. ours, you know, the card, 
you know, do you throw a card away and the telethon? <laughs> God, what else? What? How? Um, so what did you know? I mean, obviously you were clearly a fan of the show, right? Oh, you and Pat Hazel buddies, the whole thing. Well, but what did you know about gone to a ton of tapings too, because we could always get oh, in. Really? That was like the big ticket in town. Right. But because of Pat, like whenever I had friends in town, I'm like, Hey, can you know, can we come to Seinfeld? And so it was really nice that, you know, I was like the best friend of the universe. Whenever somebody from out of town came, I'm like, I can't promise it, but we might be able to get and watch the Seinfeld taping. And so that was so you, must, you must have been itching all these like early years, like, man, I gotta get on the show, or or was it not a top priority? I know you were you were doing a ton of stuff, but yeah. just just because you've worked because you've had a lot of crossover, right? I mean, you even worked with uh Barbara Stock in Tradewinds, she was on Seinfeld, you worked with um Philip Baker Hall. I bet you've had a ton of crossover of people who've been yeah. on the show. And well, and Terry Hatcher, because she had been a mutual fa- oh, friend. Yeah. And Pat. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was, yeah, you know, so many people. I guess it just kind of felt like the time will come. You know, there'll be a chance, there'll be an opportunity. It, you know, it wasn't, I never felt like I was being passed over or anything. And then it was nice when I did audition that uh, I got it. Yeah. And your, uh, and your character, your character, Kristen, was, quite lovable and you know wholesome if you will with you know the hallmark card also working at pbs like how did you prepare for the well i know you don't you don't remember much about the uh audition but how did you prepare for the role like what 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 did they tell you no ackerman wasn't there but were you in a room with like larry jay and the writers what do you remember there when i auditioned or you mean like rehearsals just kind of like the table reads and how you prepared for the role. I'm, I'm just curious. What would they tell you about Kristen, the PBS girl? Nothing really. You know, quite honestly, it was, you know, kind of <laughs> yourself, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember like a lot of notes about stuff. The one note that I remember was, you know, going into the apartment and going into the fridge and, you know, get whatever it was, like a bottle of water. And I'm like, well... I don't, I don't think that I would do that. Like I wouldn't, they go, no, everybody does. If you're Jerry, <laughs> if you go to the room, everybody goes, just go take whatever you want, get something. Right. Like, oh, okay. And so there was like that kind of direction. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know because that's what, that was kind of the thing. Like there wasn't, it was just a lot of kind of do your own thing. You know, everybody right. by then kind of knew what they were doing. And so, you know, other than blocking, uh, yeah, with you know, Ackerman too, there's probably less direction. Really yeah. sensed, but it's like it's still a comedy. It's still Seinfeld. You're not going to get like super angry, but the whole, you know, you didn't save my card and, you know, kind of storming out of there. And, uh, yeah, what I'm trying are, to. What are, you, what are your thoughts uh, on the etiquette there, on, a, on holding on to a card? How long, you know, without a mantle, you don't have a mantle, let's say. How okay. long do you, uh, what, what would you expect a, a significant other to hold on to a card for? Well, if it's a significant other, they better. Yeah, it should be in a draw. It should be for years, right? In a draw. Yeah. Backed yeah. up. And even afterwards, you know, it's kind of nice to keep it you know like it always yeah. brings memories it's like okay i don't really need this but then i'm always like but if i throw it away down the road i won't remember it all right it's like a weird way so it's more of a souvenir you know as souvien and you know french is like to remember and so i think a lot of those kinds of things but you know i i think it's i mean me personally because the older i get the less I save things, I think you're so much more, those things are so much more important in your early years. Like those things are very, they're very fundamental. It's like, you have to save it and you always save it. And even now, like we're cleaning out like old storage spaces and stuff. And I'm opening boxes of cards and letters and reading stuff that to this day, I don't even remember the people. I'm like, who is this guy? And I'm like, well, I guess I can throw that one away because I, I honestly can't even remember who these people are. And so as years go, I, the older I get, like the less and less I would save. And then it was kind of like, well, I'll just save my birthday cards. Well, I'll just save these five special birthday cards. And now like the day after my birthday, I'm like, "Eh." you know, I probably, you know, I'll save like my mom's or like, I'd always save my grandma's. Like there were things that were more sentimental just because of 
their handwriting or something like that. But uh, yeah, the the saving thing, I yeah, I was a big advocate of that. It's like you have to save it; you'll never remember. And now I'm like, well, I got too much crap, you know. Happy birthday, thank you, goodbye. Uh, so, well, even like not being sentimental, it's hilarious. You know, yesterday was Valentine's Day, and my husband and I were sitting there watching the Super Bowl, and it was like kind of the fourth quarter, and I went. Hey, tomorrow's Valentine's Day. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's like I didn't get you anything. I didn't get you anything either. And that was basically like it when it used to be, it's Valentine's Day and you know, you have to have this and you have that and I'm doing this and I'm going to wrap these presents in, you know, ascending order and various shades of pink. And, you know, it was always a big deal. And now you're like, oh, yeah, happy birthday. Do you want orange juice or coffee? <laughs> you know, it's like, so, uh, <laughs> You know, it's interesting. We're talking about Valentine's Day and, and the Hallmark card that gets thrown out by, by Jerry. And you've done a lot of a lot of movies on the Hallmark Channel. So there's that connection there, which I love the Hallmark Channel. I watch I watch all that stuff. I watched, uh, you know, Cut Color. I watch. Uh, watch all the mur- yes, I watch the Murder, She Wrote reruns almost every single day. I watch Matt. Watch Columbo, the Columbo reruns that yes. are on Hallmark because mine just mine just reran. Oh, I, I have not seen I, I'm, I have not seen yours yet, but I think I saw your Matlock. Um, oh. You were a Matlock, too. And uh, yeah, that was the very first show that I came out to LA for that I was actually still living in New York. And that was the very first show that I came out here. And I'm like, wow, California is really kind of, you know, it's like everybody's so happy. And that was like the thing I remember is like you go in the grocery store and everybody's happy and somebody's parking your car. I'm just like, everybody's so happy here. So uh, that was I'll my let, biggest yeah. revelation from when I came out from Matlock. Yeah, so yeah, it's interesting. So a girl from right Ralston, Nebraska, how does she make it to California to Matlock to eventually Seinfeld? And then I mean, man, what a career you've had. It's just been unbelievable. It was a strange progression because like growing if I'd lived like on the coast when I was a kid, I would have driven my parents nuts, like to audition. But you know, you grew up in Omaha. And I, I wanted to be an actor so bad when I was little. And I remember when when Little House on the Prairie came on TV, because that was like, those were my favorite books. And I was like almost apoplectic because it's like, they can't do it without me. I am Mary. It's like, I am Mary. Because whenever we would play like with my friends, Little House on the Prairie, it's just like, oh, I'm Mary. How can they do that without me? But then, you know, you kind of grow up and I was really academic. And by a very strange turn of events, after my Miss Nebraska thing that you mentioned, um, I was just kind of modeling locally, like no big deal, just some of the department story, blah, blah, blah. The agency that I was with has a big fashion show every year. That's kind of a contest. And I just whacked off all my hair. I cut my hair really short. And I didn't want to be in a, a model. And you know, it was like finals week. I was in college and it was finals. And, and we had this big fashion show that we had to do because it was part of the agency. And it was like, oh, my God, I don't have time for this. And I ended up winning. And I was like, me? Because everybody else in is like, you know, going to be, I'm going to be a model. And I'm like, well, I, I got to get back. I've got, a, you know, an English final in the morning. I got to get back to Lincoln. And so because I won that local modeling thing, I got, I then I got like the free trip to New York for the national one. So same thing. My first trip to New York, you know, I'm, I'm, I skipped like every rehearsal. It's like, I'm going to the Statue of Liberty. I'm going to go see cats. You know, I'm going to Greenblatt's Deli, you know, and I just had to do like all my New York stuff. And then like the night of the big, you know, uh, like modeling fashion show thing, I ended up placing fifth. And I was like, God, I should have gone to like a rehearsal or two because maybe I could have done a little better. But it was just so funny because, you know, I mean, I was a dedicated and professional and hard worker and a quick learner. But it was just like, I'm not really going to be a model. Because, you know, I was 5'7", by the skin of my teeth. I'm not super tall, but, you know, tall enough. Mm. And so then because I placed so high in that, they had agents from all over New York and all over the world. And I'll never forget it because we were at the Waldorf Astoria. And then this agent from New York that has like a sister agency in Paris, they're like, we want you to come to Paris. And, well, I have French and all through high school and college. I spoke French. I, like I knew the city geographically. I studied everything. I knew the history. And it was like Paris, like that's like even bigger than going to New York. And I'm like, yeah, I'll go. And I remember calling my mom and dad from a payphone in the, in the lobby of the Waldorf Astoria because 
it was like in August and I was supposed to go back to school. It was the summer before my senior year of college and tell my mom and dad, it's like, they want me to go to Paris. It's like, they're going to pay for it. Like I get to go, I can just go for three months and then come back to school in January. And so that was my plan. I'm like, I'm not really going to be a model. You know, I'm just going to Paris. Well, I got there and just, and again, see my hair was still really short. And so I looked kind of fashionable and, and I, even though inside I was like this girl from Nebraska, just awestruck, but smart, like well-grounded. And I just started working like nonstop. But I think it was part, the agents told me later, they just said, you were responsible. You were reliable. We could count on you. You know, some of these other girls, they yeah. get hired for a job. We don't know if they're going to show up. And so I worked nonstop and I had covers and, and I was doing a lot of editorial, like the stuff in the fashion magazines. Mm. And it was like, God, they don't like, I just felt like kind of like the jokes on them. And so to make a hugely long story short, that three months turned into three and a half years. So I spent three and a half years in Paris. I, I spent all of my summers in Tokyo. I'd go and model and, and do like commercials and kind of, you know, acting stuff in Japan where I was a huge star is hilarious. <laughs> um, and then, hey. then the funny thing, how the acting thing happened, one of the girls that I knew when I was in Paris and she was really young when she had finally gone, cause eventually you're, you're in Paris as kind of to build your book so that you go to New York and then you've got, you know, legitimate work and we start working right away. So one of the girls who I was friends with in Paris had gone to New York and got a job on um, Ryan Tope. You know, it was a soap that was on ABC. Yeah. Like, and like, we we're all back in Paris. And of course, like the first thought in my head was going back to like the seven-year-old me. And I'm like, well, she can do it. I can do it. And so, you know, when I ended up going to New York, I was literally the first day at my modeling agency. I'm signing in and everything, you know, getting all, you know, contracts and crap. And they're like, do you act? And I'm like, uh, yes. You know, <laughs> in college, right? And they're like, oh, because we just opened a theater department. So go upstairs and talk to Mike. Cool. So I go upstairs. You know, at the time, like the agency, like they were in uh, the uh, uh, Carnegie Hall. And so again, it's like that part of you that you're just like, oh my God, like I'm in Carnegie Hall is like where my agents were. And so I've never act, you know, it kind of like put together a, you know, picture and resume and stuff. The very first audition I went on, I booked and it was only supposed to be for six episodes, but I ended up, the character really caught on. It was like this little punk rock teenager. It was right during, uh, uh, like Cindy Lauper, Madonna kind of type. It was, what was it, 85? And so this character just caught on like wildfire, and I stayed on that show for six months. I mean, that was- Was that Guiding, guiding Light? No, so that was Loving, which ironically, Loving is right across the hall from Ryan's Hope. And so it was kind of like <laughs> my friends on that show, and I'm like, I can do that. And I end up on the show, like literally across the hall. I'm like, hi, hi, I'm here, I'm here. And so, so yeah. So you, you, you didn't have any formal- training per se you kind of learned as you as you went if you yeah, will i was in like i said i was in theater and high school and college yeah. it was a lot of instinct and but then once i was in new york then i started with in classes i was uh, studying with uda hagen yeah so i was in classes you know for that time and then yeah so i was there for six months and then but i wasn't under contract and so then guiding lights i had auditioned for guiding light and it was a contract role so they kind of i went over there and, you know, was on that for two and a half years. And then finally, when that was over, I, I was still modeling. But that's when I kept being brought out to L.A. constantly, like for auditions and screen tests. And then that Matlock. And I'm just kind of like, you know, I think it's might time well. to go to L.A. Yeah, and I so, might as well move there. And I came out here. So that was my circuitous route from Omaha to Paris to New York to L.A. And, and, Pat, and Pat Hazel was in between and in Nebraska and New York and then obviously back with Seinfeld. Yeah, he, uh, I met Pat in high school. We went to different high schools, but at the Omaha Community Playhouse, we were both in a dance class together. There was like, like a theater dance class. So I met him, so I knew him during high school, but I didn't go to high school with him. And then right. college, I went to college in Lincoln and he didn't, but by the, you know, he was already a comic and like doing things. And so since we were friends from the community playhouse, 
whenever he would be in Lincoln, he would call and, you know, we'd hang out, blah, blah, blah. And then stayed in touch the whole time I was in Europe. And then by the time I was in New York, he was there a lot, you know, like on tour with, with Jerry. And so that's when I really started really hanging out with him in real life was New York. And then when I came to LA, you know, he was really, he was like the best friend that I had in LA, the only person that I really knew. And even like when I moved here, we borrowed his couch for like the first, you know, month until we got a couch. And Pat Hazel was the person that introduced me to Costco because I was like going to Target for everything. It's like, don't go to Target. You got to go to Costco. And I'm like, what's that? And so, you know, it's like our memories, we go, yeah, way back. So I've known him since I was 15, probably wow. 15 or 16. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so awesome. you know, our whole careers. Yeah. Another, um, we also had on uh, P Peter Melman twice on our show. He was um, obviously a writer on Seinfeld and um, you were on his show as well. I'm curious if that was a connection through Seinfeld where you, you had met him on, on Seinfeld and then he asked you to come on or you just auditioned. But I believe you were on It's Like You Know, which was, which was yeah. his show. Well, I think, yeah, that's how he, what he knew me from. I mean, right. I still had to audition. Okay. But, you know, obviously, yeah, he knew me from that. And then, you know, and the funny thing is, is all of this stuff all took you to place like decades before social media. Right. And so keeping in touch with people in those years was a lot harder, you know, that there were a lot of people that like you work with once or something and, you know, you don't have their phone number or their address, like to right. physically write them a letter. But, you know, so keeping in touch was a little, you know, or following people from place to place and you get on a new show and you're like, oh, hi, you know. But yeah, I remember that I think, I think he pulled for me for that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I still had to audition. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, it just, we hear a lot from so many guest stars, the loyalty of the show, like what you talked about, but um, whether it's Pat Hazel or Jason Alexander, like pulling you aside and watching stuff with you. Um, another person you had a, a couple or one scene with was uh, Michael Richards. What do you, what do you remember about him? And we've heard so much about his, you know, you know what he, preparation. He mind, yes. That's exactly what I was going to say, because in my entire career, the two people that hit me the most were, was Peter Falk and Michael Richards because they worked the whole time. You know, you just go, both of those guys, like Peter Falk, you go, he could do Columbo in his sleep. But when I did Columbo, he would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and pick up the fork this way and then pick up the fork that way and then put the fork over there instead. Like he would just work and work and work. I remember like, and I was a young and actress and would just stand back in awe and watch him. And I was like, like he never stopped working. And Michael Richards was exactly the same way. Stuff that he's not in, like if we're over there on that set, he was on this set and it was like coming through the door, coming through the door. Oh my God, he must have done it 27 times until like he really got like the one way and then he would like get it, get it, get it. And then he maybe because that's again, like I was sitting up in the rafters, like when they were and just watching him and it's like, God, he worked so hard. And then, you know, just makes it probably effortless. Oh, just, you know, would throw it away. But it was like really precise. And that was a good education for me, even at that time, because, you know, a lot of my acting was always just kind of, oh, you know, instinct. <laughs> right. And so you just go, oh, people work at this. People work to make it look easy. People work like they rehearse until it doesn't look rehearsed. Right. That he was he was a technician, just the minutest detail. You know, are there three fingers on the door or four fingers on the door? Like, do you, do you, do you lean in that? I mean, it was just the, the mechanics of coming through the door. I was just like, no, I, I just couldn't stop watching him. Incredible. Yeah. We, we have heard that a lot. That's it's, it's a testament to why the show was so great. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier, you're in a kind of a unique position. I, we haven't heard anyone who, you know, the director wasn't there, you know, no Ackerman. Right. So I'm curious, um, how much Larry David, I know you mentioned he kind of was running it, but what was your experience like, you know, working with him and that, especially he's basically almost directing at that point. So I would imagine yeah. it's, um, you know, a little bit more intimate. I mean, was he giving direction? Was he giving you any type of, you know, say it this way, say it that, you know, anything like that? Or, or like, how did you, you know, what was your experience like with him? If anything, I think it was just more kind of physical placement because, you know, like to, you know, the series regulars, like they could do it with both hands tied behind their back. And so I think it was a kind of a different episode in a way where it's like, I don't know, what feels good? What do you want to do? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. 
no, we'll stand closer to him. Or, oh, no, don't stand as close. You know, it was more just that kind of stuff that there wasn't a lot of, of uh, you know, it was more kind of the mechanics than really giving direction. Because like I said, there was so much going on. Everybody else is rehearsing for the Emmys. Everybody else was. And so in a way, it was almost less focus on the show because it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's good. All right, go on. You know, and so... It, that's really kind of what it was. Like we do it and you're like, yeah, all right, that works. All right, moving on. All right, we're, we're in the restaurant now. So, it, you know, it, it really was just kind of like that gut feeling. Like this is what I would do and you just did what you wanted to do unless or until someone told you not to do it that way, you know? Yeah, so, it, it sounds like based on what you told us, the Emmy's going on, this, that, and the other thing. Ackerman's out. There were seven storylines going on. Like it was a yeah action packed week for sure. Did anything, if you remember, and it was from 1994, anything get cut that you don't remember, or like you know the the Tartable stuff? Was he ever on set with with you, and that got cut? I'm curious if there are any storylines that, or did it be true to the script? I'm trying to think because, yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, not that I can think of because, no, you know, it was tight. It was it was written like that. You know, again, it was and down more to, more, they, they knew what they were and doing. And they, they knew the timing. So it's like if it was going to be long, it was kind of taking care of head. Because like you rehearse all week. And so by the time you shoot it, it's pretty much it's pretty much camera ready. And unfortunately, yeah, it is so long ago that I don't remember little details. Uh, Do you remember why you went with the red hair? Because just my hair was red at the time, you know. Was, oh, because right, everything we've seen you back then it was blonde and then blonde after. Well, I haven't seen red much, but uh, if you watch Ellen, because I did Ellen. And actually, you know, when she had her sitcom, and it's an episode where I marry her brother. So I'm really Ellen's sister-in-law. And it was it was short and red for that. And I was on a series right after that called Live Shot, which was a series on UPN, which was the, like, the only year, because it was United Paramount Network. So Paramount had a network, because it was like right when Warner Brothers had their own network, and then... Paramount had their own network, but then UPN ended up melding with somebody like after a couple of years. Yeah, Channel Nine here in New York. Yeah, UPN. Yeah. yeah. So we, uh, yeah. So I was red for several shows. I mean, for I don't know. I'm gonna say a year, but maybe two. I yeah, I had red hair for a while, and even yeah, I was on. I was on the show called uh, One West Waikiki a Glenn Larson show that we shot in. What, what show weren't you, what show weren't you on? <laughs> you just had to have 20. Yeah, I your Cheers episode the other night. Well, that's funny that you <laughs> Cheers because you know what, at first when I was kind of thinking about going back in my mind, I remember my Cheers audition and when my mind, I'm like, oh, and I'm like, I thought it was this. I thought it was the side uh, uh, no, That was the Cheers audition. We love Cheers. We love Cheers audience. stories. If you have any, we we like we love to. We've had a few overlapping guests, and we love to find out their take. And we've heard this is what we've heard. Maybe you can confirm or deny that the the Cheers right. set was a bit more, I guess, loose, fun. Oh my uh, God! Seinfeld was a bit more business like ish. Is that kind of the take, or what, do you have any stories for us there? <laughs> Because, yeah, my, like I said, my episode was kind of weird because so much was going on. Yeah. But the Cheers one, oh, my God, yeah, the table read, like you table read, you're out. It was like, all right, 40 minutes later, you're like, all right, see you tomorrow. Like, that was it. <laughs> the next day, you kind of come, run through it beginning to end. All right, see you tomorrow. And you're like, is that it? Like, literally, you're there, like, for 45 minutes. And it's like, all right. Because, yeah, for them, it was, it was so like clockwork you know, like in their system but the funny thing is is they weren't none of the performances during the week were like the performance it was just kind of marking it da -da 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 -da. all right yeah not many notes let's go home and so all week long at cheers i'm kind of like you know it's like is this gonna come together because it was just i'd never been on a show yeah that was just so yeah that's fine all right go home yeah great goodbye 
I mean, every day I was like out of there, like in 45 minutes. And then like on Friday, when we shoot, it was like, like all of a sudden like, oh my God, I'm on Cheers. Like then it really felt like it because then, you know, like they became like the full characters and, you know, the full performance and you've got, and then, I mean, I was so like, it, it took until Friday to go, oh my God, this is Cheers. Because all week long I was a little, is this okay? Is that right? Am I, you know, because it was like, hello, goodbye. Hello, goodbye. So yeah, very relaxed, you know, just in and out. Like I didn't really know what was going to happen until Friday. And then the cameras rolled and you're like, oh my God, you know, and then, then it was kind of more fun too, because it felt like the first time, you know, and it felt so real. And so the performances were like really genuine because that is the tough thing with with sitcoms and comedy is you know it's not funny the third and fourth time you know the fr- you know you read it in the table reading it's like first you read it in the script like ha 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 that's funny and then you do it at the table reading it's like ha ah, that's funny and then you know you put it on its feet and you kind of do it it's like oh yeah that's funny and then the second day it's like it's you know it's not as funny as it, yeah i don't know should we change it and so a lot of sitcoms it's like they they work it and work it and work it to the point that you kind of work some of the funny out because it's hard for it to still be funny by the fourth day. And so a lot of shows almost like rehearse and change too much. And so maybe that's what they really had going for them at Cheers is you go, it's on the page. It's on the page. Right. It's in the characters. And I remember so much on the page. Here's what is hilarious. When I auditioned for Cheers, I was having my boyfriend, I'm like, oh, here, read this with me. And I'm doing the scene. And then afterwards, he's like, he's like, what is this? It's like, it's like this guy is like, it's like, what is this? And I'm like, cheers. And he's like, oh, he's like, oh my God. Okay. Oh my God. That's funny. And like, it's, it is because you go to the character, you know, like, cause my right. scene, Sam and stuff, it's like, it. who is this Sam guy? He's kind of a jerk. And like, it's cheers. And you go, oh my God, that's so funny. You know? And so it, yeah. Like, so for Cheers, it was already on the page and those guys knew it, that it, you didn't have to work it to death. And so a lot of the jokes just stayed. Like there was really nothing to change or work or, you know. Right. It's all, so, they're all geniuses. Oh, God. Yeah. Is yeah. When, uh, when, when Norm says something, it's funny versus uh, the average Joe. But, uh, but you, and to your point, you, you think it's funny time after time, like the pledge drive has certainly uh, stood the test of time. We just yeah. watched it a couple of times over the days. I'm still very funny. If, do you, like you, you mentioned your husband, do you guys ever flip through the channels? You see the pledge drive. You obviously stay on it, right? I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Because like my husband, like, he didn't know me then. You know, and then like you go, oh my God, I was so young. I was so pretty. I'm like, come here, honey, look at me. You know, and I, I like, I feel like I'm watching somebody I used to know. I'm just like, look at me. I'm so pretty. And then he's so sweet. He's like, honey, you're still pretty. I'm like, but not like that. I don't look like that anymore. <laughs> you know, and it's just so, I'm like, it, it was still so, I was anyway, like innocent. You know, like there was still such a naivete. And uh, so it is funny when, like I watch with him who didn't know me then because to me, I feel like, look at this girl, you know, and he's just like, yeah, it's you. I'm like, no, it's not. She's so innocent. She's so cute, you know? So yeah. Or, or if I'm just flipping channel. Is that like the, the, the PBS clipboard, you seem so official, like, you know, running that whole show with the pledge <laughs> drive, you know? Yeah. Oh, always have the utmost respect for, uh, for my favorite Jerry girlfriend. So what did uh, Uncle Leo, he talked about lunch with him. Like any cool stories about like old Hollywood from him or did you guys kind of hang out and just eat a meatball parm? I wish I could remember. You know, those were at the times, you know, like when some of these shows, when I look back, like at the time you don't realize that you're living history. Like at the time, another day at work, you know, it's just another day in your life. And you know it's special because you're doing that. But again, it was before any social media. It was before eBay. You know, it's not like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna save my clipboard. I can sell this on eBay someday. Or, you know, I know, you know, it's like you just didn't, or I, at least I didn't think like that so much then. Like you kind of forget 
that it was living history. And so if I could go back now, oh my God, yeah, I'd be hanging on to every word. And, you know, I would go in with questions every morning for him had, had I known. And I think at the time, I know we had interesting conversations and yeah, it just bums me out that I don't remember. Isn't that sad? You know, that I don't yet remember the specifics of what we talked about, but I had lunch with him every day. So no, I think it's that's life. It's I mean, the small, it's the small it. things at the moment. So you, you remembered him walking you, you know, there every day. I think that's what you took with you. It sounds like, yeah. which is you know more personal than anything else, which you know goes a long way if you remember it still now. Um, and uh, we agree with your husband, by the way. You look, you look tremendous. I mean, <laughs> uh, what, what, um. What do you have going on now? I, I we, you know, obviously we looked at your IMDb. I see this ma- menopause. Is that? Can you talk about that, or is that something well, that's coming out funny. soon? Or? Yeah, it's a pilot that we shot. That uh, it's kind of a twist because it, it's menopause, and so it's these men, like the guys, that are turning fifty-five, and all of a sudden okay. their life is like not what it used to be, you know. And it's a <laughs> really great. It's so well written because it, it's three couples and they're all so different. It's like one couple and they're more kind of artsy, funky, maybe, you know, kind of grown up hippies. And the other couple that, you know, it's a mixed racial one and and just more, you know, kind of businessy. And then my husband, Richard Berge, plays my husband and he's, you know, the big, very wealthy, you know, hot shot. And I'm the second wife. And so I'm kind of the trophy wife, but he's just recently retired. And so he's kind of like kicking back and life is good. But like, I'm like this balls to the wall businesswoman and, and top of stuff. And all he kind of wants to do is like, let's just like relax and have a good time. And I'm just like, da, 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 da. This kind of like little workhorse. And uh, so it's really the focus on the men adjusting to their lives being different, you know, as opposed to, you know, because there's always stories about, you know, women getting older and there's really not stories about men. And, you know, your life really changes. A lot of stuff changes for men. And so it's, it's hilarious. It's so funny. And, you know, like, we're like the six of us are all kind of best friends, but I'm, I'm a little bit of the odd man out because I'm the newest one to the group. Like they've all been friends forever. And so, uh, yeah, so we're just kind of, well, Richard, you know, they're shopping. Richard, now. He's a Richard Berg. He's a funny guy. And also a scientist as well. He was on uh, the Hamptons episode, if I recall. Yeah, I don't remember. Which and Bergy and I go back to, well, when I mentioned before, uh, one West Waikiki that we shot in Hawaii, he and Cheryl Ladd were the two leads on that. And I played his ex-girlfriend, you know, and I'm like this journalist reporter, you know, kind of a little busybody pain in the ass, always like in <laughs> all the crimes because I've got to get the story. And so I'd known Bergy for years. Uh, and so it was kind of cool that, you know, we got to be the married couple. So, yeah, we're just waiting. You know, somebody's got to pick it up. And I hope nobody steals the idea before they pick it up. And it was a really great group. And you know who else was in it is um like Jane... Uh, Oh God, she was on uh, um, Friends. That she was, uh, she was the lesbian wife, uh, you know. Um, oh, yes. And and Eric Lutz is in it, and like it was just like brilliant casting. Like it was one of those, and we all we go, we want it to go because oh my God, like it would just really be like real life, like friends being together all the time. So uh, yeah, so. Very cool waiting for that to be sold and <laughs> but i have got auditions coming out of my ears this week it is crazy i literally i shot one on sunday before the super bowl and then i had one yesterday i just shot one today before going on this and i have auditions wednesday Thursday, Friday. oh my gosh are they still all on wow. zoom or are you going live yet are they still like no, on they're, zoom, but they're on tape they're on tape they're all yeah. self-tape yeah so you know, on one hand, it's it's more work, but then on the other hand, I'm a little bit of a control freak. Okay. So, so I kind of like yeah, yeah. self-tape because, you know, it's like, okay, lower the lights. Okay, cut it. Like, I, I start, like, directing. And even today, like, the guy that I shoot, like, he, he's like, what did you do DP? Because I'm like, but if you put the light down here. But, you know, it's true. You, you know, I've done this for how many decades? Like, you do know what you know. And so... The good thing about the self tape is you go, 
I can kind of go into it with what I know. The thing that for us actors that's I think a bit detrimental in this time period with the self tapes is we have absolutely no direction. No, you know, you're not in the room and they're like, hey, try it this way. You know, you don't have any of the real life stuff. Like when your tape starts, it's really all character. Um, but it's nice because I've been, since I work in Canada and the U.S., because I'm legal to work in Canada as a Canadian, uh, so I get an audition for a lot of American productions that shoot up there mm. that I might not get the chance to audition for here. So I kind of get to do double duty that, uh, you know, I have L.A. auditions and then I have Canadian auditions, even though they're still four. U.S. shows. So there's like a lot of new shows coming nice. on that are fun and interesting and they're all it's, yeah, you know, like really strong women. Like I feel like, oh, I must be doing something right because now all of a sudden, like this trend of these women, these roles, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, it's like, oh, she's <laughs> That's great. You know, the victim's wife and she just cries the whole time. That's not really me. So uh, Very cool. Yeah, we know you're a big out, outdoors, uh, avid outdoors uh, lover, and you know the the biking and everything else, surfing. Live outside. Yeah, that would be like you know it's always like your dream job is like to shoot on location, like somewhere, yeah, you know, like some kind of action adventure show where you just go, oh my god, I don't need hair or makeup, and you just get to run and climb and ride horses and fall down, and you know, like it's still. You know, there's still that that dream of like, what's the perfect show? Uh, so yeah, yeah, well, actually, stuff is 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 fun for me. I like that kind of stuff. For us, the perfect show was Seinfeld, and we're so glad that you were a part of it. We're just thrilled with everything that's going on with you. I mean, if you haven't seen Love Hard, it's unbelievable. So fun, um, fun. We hope man, yeah, we hope Manipause gets picked up. Um, we love all the work you do with Dog Rescue. You're just you're, you're a treat, Rebecca. We can't thank you enough for for coming on the show. Yeah, I wish we could meet in real life. I mean, it's fun because <laughs> because we all get to stay home or be where we are. But I'm like, it'd be I'm like you guys are great. Like it'd be fun. Well, to tell you me. what, tell you what, when it's when it's Jets Rams next year for the Super Bowl, we we'll for that. What do you say? Okay, <laughs> got it, got it. This was great, Rebecca. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, guys. We had a great time. <laughs> you brought back like you know it's so funny because i'm thinking i don't remember very much and then it's amazing like what you really remember when you know once you start talking about it yeah awesome you thanks again thank you so much thanks so much yeah we'll uh we'll yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll send this to you in a couple of weeks it's probably going to be two two and a half weeks before we go live with it okay yeah let me know let me know for sure thank you so much all right bye have a great night <laughs>